We are Irish Side of the Moon. Freedom of information. Personal empowerment. The Irish Side of the Moon. I still have with me. There are many sources of energy available. Everything is energy. My God, do we need this one. Free our mind. My mind. just a ride. ride. We can change it anytime we want. It's only a choice. No effort, no work, no job, no savings of money. A choice right now. Between fear and love. Love, love, love. love. Corporations have taken over the world. Freedom of information. Personal empowerment. The Irish side of the moon. Good evening and welcome to the 79th edition of the Irish Side of the Moon documentaries, interviews, whatever you want to call them. Tonight's guest is uh, charming, to say the least, and I'm not saying that in a in a, a, a sarcastic way. He, he He's the real deal. He's a, such a gentleman. His name is Lionel Fanthorpe. Some listeners out there may, may remember a TV program called Fortean TV, which uh, investigated various sort of supernatural happenings. Uh, it was big in the 1990s, kind of a Channel 4 type thing. Um, apart from that, he's uh, written more than 250 books. Now, some of them are pulp fiction. It was a way of making a few quid in the 50s. He's the president of the British UFO Research Association and the Association for the Scientific Study of Anomalous Phenomena. Uh, he is a journal, was a journalist. He's also a Dan Grade martial arts instructor and a weight training instructor. And he tells a nice little story about that in the interview. And on top of all that, he's an Anglican priest, married for 50 years to the same woman who he clearly adores. And again, you get that sense during the interview. I really enjoyed t- chatting with this guy. I sort of guy I, I, I'd love to sit down and have a pint with. And he's the sort of guy I think would definitely like to sit down and have a pint. He's, he's, a, he's a great guy, really super guy, full of beans. And I really hope you enjoy this show. Nice one. Uh, good evening, Reverend Robert Lionel Fanthorpe. Um, I'd like to start off the, uh, the the interview with you, if you don't mind, with a, a series of true or false questions, if you wouldn't mind. My pleasure. Excellent. You're a writer and journalist, true or false? Uh, that's true. You're president of the British UFO Research Association? That's true. And the Society for the Scientific Study of Anomalous Phenomena? Yep, I plead guilty. Uh, you have presented a TV show in the 1990s called Fortean TV? Yes, and a number of other shows before and since. You're a member of Mensa? I am indeed. And the Ghost Club? Yes. <laughs> a, <laughs> you're a Dan Grade martial arts instructor, true or false? That's true. You're a weight training instructor, true or false? That's true. I trained with Ken Price, who was then representing Wales. He taught the rest of us. Wow. You're a script writer? Yes. You're a Harley Davidson biker enthusiast? Well, I'm a biker enthusiast, but I no longer have my Harley Davidson. I'm riding a Kawasaki at the moment, oh dear. which is slightly bigger. Um, it's the big Kawasaki Drifter, which is the 1500 twin. So the electric glide is gone? Yep. It, uh, after many years of faithful service, it... Uh, decided it wasn't going to go through its MOT anymore. (laughs) (laughs) You're a singer-songwriter? Yes, I am. You're an after-dinner speaker? I do a lot of that, yes. A management consultant? Yeah, I'm a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Management, and I do consultation when I'm asked. And on top of all of that, you're an Anglican priest? I am indeed, yep. Okay, we're done here. I'm leaving because I'm I'm tired already. <laughs> <laughs> In all seriousness, though, if if with your with your permission, of course, what I'd like to do is to go right back to the start because. In all the research that I've done about you, I've discovered uh, many, many things. But there's, it kind of starts in the 1950s, and I know that you uh, have a couple of years on you before that. So what I'd like to do is to kind of go back to the very, very start. Um, you're not a Welsh native, or are you? No, but oh. by no means. I was out as far from Wales as you can get geographically. Uh, I'm a Norfolkman. Right. I was born in a little town called Deerham, which is geographically in more or less the center of Norfolk. And uh, I came to Wales in 1979, so I've been here 32 years. And uh, it was uh, as headmaster, I wasn't a priest in those days, I came as headmaster of uh, one of the big Cardiff high schools, the Glyn Deru, which uh, translates from the Welsh as Oak 
Valley. So it was Oak Valley High School or Glenderu High School. And I was there for 11 years. I think I prefer the Welsh version because the Oak Valley sounds a little bit like it belongs on an American t- TV show for, for teenagers. <laughs> yeah, it does, does it, yeah. <laughs> um, now, I know all of the things that you've gotten involved in in your adult life, but I suppose I want to go back to your childhood. You were born in 1935, so your early childhood would have been through the war. Um, yep. Was there anything that would have happened at that time that might have triggered later interests? Or were you always interested in the paranormal? Were you always interested in, in, in sort of unsolved mysteries? Well, when I was a very, very small boy, um, again, before the war, uh, my mother and father told me of an extremely strange experience that they had had. And uh, they, putting it in a nutshell, um, mum saw what she thought was my father standing beside the little fire in their bedroom, as uh, we used to have in those days, and she was surprised because it was the middle of the night and uh, my father's name was also Robert and she called him Bob and she said, Bob dear, are you all right? And was, you know, why are you out of bed standing by the fire? And then it turned round and it wasn't him. And she put her arms across the bed and lo and behold, he was sleeping peacefully beside her. And then it, whatever it was by the fireplace, just faded and vanished. And I think it was after my parents told me that story of the the haunting of their bedroom in our old house where I grew up, that uh, maybe that's one of the things that triggered my interest in the paranormal. Right. Nice one. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Um, But then, if we say moving on uh, through the war, and you... Must you, I, I, you, I know you were a journalist, and I know you were also a teacher. Did they happen at the same time, or were they separate? No, it was... Uh, the, the journalism came first. I was our man in Chroma for a small weekly paper called the Norfolk Chronicle. And uh, I'd been with them only a few months, and our representative in Chroma um, moved on to Fresh Fields. Uh, I think he went to the USA. He got a wonderful promotion. And the editor came into me one day. I just turned up as one of the assistants in the head office in Fakenham. And he said, uh, I want you to get in your car and drive to Cromer. Here's the key of the office. You're now in charge over there. And I said, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> and uh, that, that was um, that was 1952 when I, got to, I was sort of upgraded from a junior cub reporter to the man in charge of the Cromer office. And it was... Uh, a wonderful time that I had there. Uh, we were just a little weekly paper that came out. You know, we used to put it to bed on a Thursday night, and it came out on a Friday. And the thing I remember most vividly was that I was there when King George the Sixth died, and he died at Sandringham in Norfolk. And we got the story because we were local, and it was the only time in the history of the paper that we came out on the same day as the Nationals with the same headline. Quite a coup. Quite a coup. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah that was 1952. Now, also in the 1950s, okay, well, I want to talk about the teaching part as well because I have a, I have a special interest in that. I, I do a little bit of it myself. But well, that's great. Yeah. So, But I wanted to sort of, um, I know at this time as well, you started to write for, for the Badger people. Yep, I sold my first short story to um, Badger Books, and that was in 1952. And it was a story called Worlds Without End. And looking back on it, after all the uh, the hundreds of stories I wrote for them over the next few years, I should have called it Words Without End. <laughs> uh, the, the, the Badger science fiction and uh, paranormal that I did, or the speculative fiction, if we run the two together. Uh, which I greatly enjoyed doing, and um, trying you, to think also also at that time I was uh, uh, I got interested in teaching and uh, I got a job first uh, uncertificated. And okay. I went in as an uncertificated teacher, and I started that was in 1958, which was the year after Patricia and I were married. But. Uh, the reason that I, I suppose I, I'm, I'm I'm curious about that because I mean you wrote ridiculous amounts. I mean ridiculous amounts. At one point, it it, it seems that you you wrote eighty nine books in three years, which works out as one hundred and fifty eight pages. A, a, a book that lasts that of the length of one hundred and fifty eight pages every twelve days. Yeah, that's about it. 
Um, I, and I was holding down a full-time job at the same time. <laughs> I, I wasn't a full-time writer. Um, I used to use one of those old-fashioned reel-to-reel tape recorders that, um, you know, they, they, if you see one in a film, it dates the film. They were that old. <laughs> and uh, then I bought two or three more so that I could uh, send reels out to a team of part-time typists who were some friends and some family. Um, there was, uh, I remember it was one of my colleagues' wives used to be a very good typist, and then uh, my sister-in-law used to do a bit of typing for me. My mother did some because she ran a shorthand typing school, and uh, uh, Patricia did some. So uh, that's why some of the endings tended to be a little rushed, because you can't tell when you're dictating whether you're dictating at 150 words a minute or 300 words a minute. And when the muse was flowing, I was going pretty fast. And so I'd take the reel to one of the typists, and uh, she would come back and say, I've got as far as um, page 143. Now, the plot was by no means finished. And one of my classical rushed endings, we had to bring in a forbidden weapon. It was the only thing I could think of that would get the heroes out of trouble. <laughs> and they all had these wonderfully British names like Carruthers. And now I have these two guys talking to each other. There's um, Harrison and Carruthers are on board the spaceship in the alien planet, and they're surrounded by intelligent amphibians who are being very unfriendly and want to eat them if possible. And so Carruthers says to Harrison, there's nothing for it, old chap. We'll have to use, long pause, the forbidden weapon. <laughs> and so, yes. And there, inside the spaceship, in a sealed compartment which required two keys to unlock it, was this thing, the forbidden weapon, not to be used. So, of course, they <laughs> took it out and used it. <laughs> And it was a bit like a long-range version of a pressure cooker because it cooked the enemy from the inside when oh you my God. it at them. <laughs> How did your mind come up with this? <laughs> now, I, by its very nature, Pulp Fiction is is that... Uh, you must have had some fun be- uh, writing some of this stuff because I've, I have a couple of quotes here that a, a fan of yours... There's a website devoted to this, you know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and they, but they picked out some choice ones. Uh, if you don't mind, I just throw a few Please, of them. Please, I'd love no, I'd love you to, Shane. I'd love you to read them. He and, looked uh, down inside his mind introspectively. And the other one, two days passed uneventfully and bohemianly. <laughs> I love that. I think that's brilliant. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> the city slept. Men slept. Women slept. Children slept. Dogs and cats slept. <laughs> you, you really we, must have had great fun. Yeah, what we I had tremendous fun. What we what we have to just bear in mind there is that these guys paid me on wordage, and it was ten shillings or fifty pence in modern money for a thousand words. So that uh, for a fifty thousand word novel, which was what they ran to, I got the princely sum of twenty five pounds. And uh, what amuses me somewhat today is that. Uh, a number of them have now become collector's pieces, and you'll see them on the internet where where a collector has got more than one copy, and he's putting it up on it for 50 quid or 60 quid. Wow. Mind you, 25 Uh, quid, that was good money at that time, I would imagine. Well, it wasn't bad. We could live on it. Yeah, Yeah, We lived on it. It it paid the mortgage, (laughs) and that meant that we could have my salary for other more interesting things, like Uh, raising our children. Brilliant. Brilliant. The other thing I really love is all the different pseudonyms. Uh, they're absolutely brilliant. And I, I, I was going through them, and you know, those are Othello Baron and Earl Barton and Lionel Roberts. And then stuck in the middle, and I was a little bit thrilled being an Irishman, there is Peter O'Flynn. Ah, now, <laughs> what we used to do, they would ask me, and uh, I, I like that name myself. Um, they were all partial anagrams, except for one or two of the house names which Spencer's Badger Books themselves came up with. But all the ones that you've mentioned are partial anagrams of Robert Lionel Fanthorpe, so that I could always say, hey, that's one of mine, have you paid me for it? And Very was, good, <laughs> yes, smart guy. <laughs> yeah, so that was just one of the things we did. But the the idea of the, the, the Peter of Flynn, and there was another one, um, 
gosh, I've forgotten what to say. Well, I'll throw you a few out here. You've got Othello Barron, Earl Barton, Lee Barton, Thornton Bell, Leo yep. Brett, Bron yep. Fane, Mel J, Marston Johns, L.P. Kenton. I love this one. Oban Lerteth. That's the one I couldn't think of. All right. He's a Welshman. <laughs> 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 and what they used to ask me to do was to send in, you know, five short stories. And they wanted them all different, so they looked as if they came from genuinely different authors. I mean, we're, we're driving a torpedo through the Trade Descriptions Act, but some of the back cover introductions contain phrases like, five of today's leading supernatural authors. It was all me. And I used to write those introductions as well. And the, uh, the Peter of Flynn stories were set in Ireland, and the Oben Lurtef stories were set in Wales, and there was uh, there were one or other Scottish authors as well. Oh, uh, I think uh, Elton T. Neef might be one of those. Maybe. Uh, I think he, I think he could well be. <laughs> but so, when you looked at one of the old collections of Badger Book supernatural stories, uh, you, you'd have one that was set in Ireland and possibly. Uh, related to a banshee and there'd be another one from scotland in which it would be i think one of them was called lord of the crags and there was some strange monster living up on ben nevis brilliant i i absolutely brilliant i i, I must say I, I i've never read one but i, I kind of want to after doing all the work that I've, I've been research i've been doing on you over the last little while oh, that's, well i'm very honored that you should take so much time to do the research i really am well i remember for i remember 14 tv i remember it being on and i actually rewatched a couple of episodes of it there it was it was a lovely little show actually so it was well i i enjoyed it very very much and the uh, uh, you know, when you were asking me earlier about being a singer-songwriter, we always used to end the show with a song. And, yeah. Uh, I can remember uh, one I did, um, I don't know if it was on 40 and it was later, but it's one that lingers in my mind. It's the one about the uh, the Sasquatch, which was, you know, the American and Canadian version of the Yeti. From yeah, the, the Bigfoot, yeah. And uh, the Bigfoot, yeah. Um I think if I could just remember one verse, if our listeners could bear it. We were climbing in the Rockies by a pine-ringed mossy patch, and there upon a boulder sat a seven-foot Sasquatch. And so it goes on. <laughs> I was just listening. As soon as I heard patch, I knew what was coming. <laughs> <laughs> yes! Brilliant. Yeah, there's a sort of inevitability about the rhyme scheme. Yeah, but then there you go, it has to be that way. Okay, I'm going to jump back again just briefly because we did mention at the start that you became a teacher and then you became a headmaster. Now, I'm yeah. a teacher and in a million years I would never like to be a headmaster. How did you find that experience for 10 oh, years? Oh, let, 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 me, let me tell you about it. I've got one or two little tales that will amuse you, I'm sure, there, Shane. I, um, I, I, said, wait, I started as an uncertificated teacher in 1958. I went to college in 1961. And because I was then 25, they let me do what was then a three-year training course in two years, provided I went in weekends and did extra lectures and extra tutorials. So there was a group of us who uh, got through our uh, teaching certificates in uh, two years instead of three. And then I went back to the school where I had been an uncertificated teacher. That was Deerham Boys Secondary Modern. That was actually my old hometown of Deerham in Norfolk. Now, I taught there until 1967 when I got promoted to be the further education tutor at one of the village colleges. You know, the, the Cambridgeshire Village Colleges, there's 12 of them. Right. And I went to the one called Gamwingay where I had a tremendous time for a few years. Then I got a phone call, and you can imagine sitting in your office or in your classroom in your school, the phone goes, and it's for you, and a voice which sounded like, if you remember the old Itma, Tommy Handley shows, he had a character during the war who was called Fumpf, and this was a German spy. And it sounded just like on the Tommy Handley comedy show, this voice used to say in a music hall German accent, this is from speaking. And uh, so this, this mysterious voice said, is it safe to talk? <laughs> and I look around and I'm in my classroom. I said, yes, yeah, as far as I know, go ahead. And the voice continued, 
we are the Phoenix Timber Company of Raynham in Essex, near London, and we are looking for our first training manager. Your name has been given to us. Uh, would you be interested in coming down for an interview? So I thought, hey, big compliment, headhunted, gosh. So yeah. I went down, <laughs> and I went down to the uh, Phoenix Timber Company and uh, I had an interview with the personnel manager and he kicked me upstairs to see two of the directors who must also have liked what I said because they then kicked me on to see Alex Gurvich, who was the Russian millionaire who ran the Phoenix Timber Company. His uncle had come to the UK in 1917 and founded the business and it was called Phoenix because there had been a disastrous fire at one time. Um, but they'd recovered from that, and they were a, a very interesting company to work with. So they offered me the job, and I said, yes, thank you. And I saw them all the way through. What they wanted a training manager for was a guy who could see them all the way through the change to metrication and the change to decimal currency, which was all happening about the same time. Of course, yes. And, uh, so, uh, and I'd written a couple of books on decimalization and metrication, and they seemed to think that that was the qualification they really wanted, so I was with them, had a great time with them for three or four years, and then our kids were growing up, and even on the good salary that I was getting as a training manager, we couldn't afford the kind of house and garden in London that Patricia and I had both grown up in as Norfolk kids, and we wanted to have um, a garden that our children could play in, just as we had enjoyed playing in our parents' gardens when we were kids. Of course. Uh, so I came back um, into state school teaching um, at a school called Hellerston, just outside Norwich. And uh, I was there from 72 until 79. I came as head of the English department, I think on the strength of some of my writing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then I was sitting in the staff room one day and reading the Times Educational Supplement, as I'm sure you do on occasion as a teacher. And uh, one of my friends was saying as we had our coffee, you know, the latest thinking on this line is, I was then deputy head, he said, if you don't get your first headship before you're 45, they won't look at your application. And I was then 44. <laughs> so I thought, oh, <laughs> Time I to get a move get, on. <laughs> I think I'd better get a move on. And I applied for two or three, and the uh, school in Wales here in Cardiff was kind enough to invite me for an interview, and then they very kindly offered me the job, and I had an amazing 11 years at Gwinderu High School in Ely, which is um, an out, one of the outskirts of Cardiff. And it was a tough area. Uh, there were some very large council estates, and it had a, should we say, a reputation for producing uh, fairly difficult young people and some fairly difficult parents. And after I'd been there a few weeks, I used to like to get there early in the morning. You know, as a teacher yourself, um, I like to get there early in the morning, have a walk around the schoolyard and make sure there was no problem, no troubles. And there was a nasty-looking object on the schoolyard one morning, and I, I thought, I know what you're up to, sunshine. You are here, because my kids are aged 11 to 18, you are here to give that nasty white powder to my teenage children, and if you can lure any of the girls down to the, the vice area of Cardiff was then Butte Street, which was famous down to the docks. And uh, you'll be trying to get some of our teenage girls down there working for uh, things we'd rather they didn't. And uh, so I asked him politely if he would uh, leave my schoolyard. Right. He ignored me. So I asked him again, if you don't have any business in my school, I don't want you here move. And the third time I asked him to move, I could see almost through his head. I was wearing a suit, collar and tie, sort of, you know, headmaster's gear, and I could see him summing me up, because he thought of himself as one of the Ely tough guys, and he was thinking to himself, this bloke 
is a middle-class nobody. The worst he'll do is threaten to telephone the police. So he spat on my shoe. And uh, Lovely. He didn't quite know what he'd run into, but I'm the guy who took the East of England silver medal a few years before I came over here. <laughs> Um, also, as you were saying at the beginning, I'm a weight training instructor, so I, without any effort, I picked him up on my left arm. I just grabbed his lapels and hoisted him up in the air. And he suddenly realized, and I must say I enjoyed it, because he turned very pale. And that supercilious, <laughs> I'm a hard man, you're a middle-class idiot, went from his face. And I then drew the other fist back. And I said, if you ever spit at me again, Sonny, it will be all of your front teeth. <laughs> then I dropped him. <laughs> You're good on these you... lines. I wish I could think of those lines in those kind of situations. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I'm sure you could do even better. But uh, I dropped him. He scrambled to his feet and ran. And in 11 years, he never came back. That's great. I like to think that uh, I may have saved one or two of the kids who were my responsibility from... Uh, getting mixed up with the uh, the nasty white powder that he was, uh, sure. you know, distributing. Did you enjoy working with the kids? Oh, I did very, very much. I've mm. got, um, I mean, although it was uh, 30 years ago when I started, I uh, I was in the supermarket the other day, and I'm, uh, I'm only five foot eight. Uh, I'm one of those sort of square shapes <laughs> What we call in Wales a brick outhouse. Oh, <laughs> yes, I, I I know the term, and I'm familiar with the other term as well, as I'm sure are all our listeners. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, it, it, it's a good shape when you're a martial arts man, but it's uh, it, it's not really helpful if you're trying to reach a packet of cornflakes off the top shelf. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I stopped one of the assistant managers and uh, who was going past with his clipboard, and I said, I'm sorry to bother you, but uh, could you pass me packet of cornflakes and he laughed and said mr fanthorpe it'll be a pleasure and he Lovely. said I'm one, of your, I'm one of your old students i didn't recognize him of course he's a guy in his 30s by the wonderful time. isn't that lovely it's very very nice to be recognized when it just you know in a nice simple you, way too nothing yeah that's nice i like yeah, that uh, it, it was great to watch. i said i had a great <laughs> time there and uh, um during the course of, of the time there we uh, were able to help a number of them, and some of our young people it, who came from what had been a difficult area um, got into the legal profession, they went to university, uh, one or two of them did medicine successfully, one or two of them went into show business, and I thought, well, I haven't, uh, I haven't totally wasted their time, and I've put in the best of effort I can, and uh, it only goes to show that if you can help and encourage, well, as I said, you're a teacher too. I'm sure that you do exactly the same thing. But the most <laughs> we try. <important> thing, <laughs> I'm sure that you do brilliantly. And the most important thing that we as teachers can give our young people is encouragement and belief in their own ability. And that yeah. we can let them have their heads and they'll go. And I still enjoy teaching enormously. I do a lot of private teaching. And uh, I've been uh, at about four hours today. Um, between everything else. And in a way, if I could just um, bring in a small point here, that it was my work in a school that uh, led me towards the priesthood. And Okay, because I was just getting to that. So lovely, oh, fire no, ahead. It, That's great. I, I, exactly I, where I was going next. Wonderful. Oh, I don't want to preempt it. but uh, Not at all. That worked away. Well, what happened was we had an extremely nice young lad in the fifth year I remember it as if it was yesterday, and his name was Peter James. And Peter had a brother who ran a food warehouse uh, in Cardiff, and he had gone down to help his brother. It was just before Christmas. And he was riding on the top of a forklift truck, and the driver forgot that he had a passenger. He went under a doorway, and Peter was killed. Oh, dear. And there's a lovely 16, 15-year-old, 16-year-old boy, and our two daughters were roughly the same age. And, you know, when you're a loving parent yourself and a young person of the same age as your children is killed in that sort of accident, you know, your heart goes out to the bereaved parents. And I, I went round to see them. Of course. Them. And uh, just as a layman in those days, but as a sincere Christian layman, I shared my views of the afterlife and 
while sympathizing from the depth of my heart with the boy's death, I did my best to share my faith that there is a better world to come and that his parents would see him again when in God's good time they went to that new world. And that uh, I'm sure that there Peter was safe in the hands of God and would welcome them when they came. Now, as I was leaving, Peter's sister, his elder sister, came to the door with me and said, Headmaster, I don't know what you've said to my mother, but she is calmer and better now than she has been. She's been in a state of shock since Peter was killed. You have said something which has helped and comforted her, and I, I can't thank you enough. Oh, said, how lovely. Yeah, and I, I felt that if I'd ever done anything useful in my life, that was it. And it then occurred to me, a little bit at a time, that if I trained as a part-time, non-stipendium priest while I was still teaching, it's a bit like doing an external degree, that I could maybe help other bereaved families. And... They accepted my application, and I trained as a priest, and uh, ordained about three years later, and uh, been uh, working that way part time ever since, as uh, in a non non stipendiary capacity. Okay. And I was uh, uh, today, for example, I was with a bereaved family, and uh, I was doing what I had done all those years ago to try to help the bereaved family of young Peter James and. It seems that in the church, you get, shall we say, somebody who has uh, a gift of music, and he'll become a choir master, or he'll be a church organist. Someone else is a very keen footballer and sportsman, and he'll take the church youth team out, and he'll build a, a youth club with a sporting centre. Um, somebody else may be a brilliant preacher, uh, and so forth and so forth. Uh, another one may be an outstanding theologian and uh, be able to argue philosophy and theology. And I just seem to have this uh, sort of empathy and fellow feeling uh, with the bereaved. And uh, I get um, perhaps more uh, requests to conduct funerals than any other part of my religious work. And I always think that it was because of young Peter that... Uh, I got into that area uh, of the church's work. Wonderful. On that little point, we, we normally take a little break at this point. You're listening to The Irish Side of the Moon. You can hear our new episodes every Monday on radiomedia.org and irishsideofthemoon.blogspot.com. You can also download episodes from iTunes, Stitcher, and many other sites. You can follow us on Twitter, you can join our Facebook group, and if you're already in the group, don't forget to invite your friends. If you have any ideas for future guests on the show, send an email to shane at the Irish side of the moon dot IE. We are Irish side of the moon, freedom of information, personal empowerment. Okay, so we're back on again. And um, I wanted to, one of the, the areas that you obviously started to get interested in was the paranormal area. Um, we mentioned at the start, Bufora, the British UFO Research Association. Um, uh, and I suppose my question, really, that I, that I have to ask, that, that it's, it's in the back of my mind all the time, being an Anglican priest, being being part of the church, do you do you not find a conflict in any way with sort of one part of your life and the other part of your life? No, well, I'd love to try and uh, show you how I've, um, in my own mind and to my own satisfaction, if nothing better, that I've been able to join up the two halves. Um, the uh, Interest in the paranormal is, as it has gone on. I've uh, I started. Um, I think my interest as a child. I read H. G. Wells. I read Hugo Gernsback. I read Edgar Allan Poe, and I loved reading about the paranormal as fiction. And then it occurred to me that it would be a thousand times more interesting to investigate real life mysteries. And this is how it began. And uh, very fortunate in that. My Patricia shares my interest in it, and we often laugh and say, if I'd been a plumber, she would have learned to use a blow lamp and help me in my work. <laughs> and uh, 
you know, if uh, whatever it was that we both enjoyed doing, we loved doing things together. As I know, we we got married in 1957, and it's uh, it it still seems just like yesterday. We're uh, we're still crazily romantic about each other, and I, I just thank God that I'm so mm. such a wonderful part. It's a great thing. But, uh, it's a great thing to uh, see. Well, it, it is. It's it's absolute heaven on earth with a girl like her. Wonderful. And the um, the supernatural and the religious side of my life, uh, as I said, the, the two of us investigate the paranormal together. We love to go out on site and to. Uh, I did a documentary, for instance, in the the um, tomb in Barbados, in Christchurch near St. Oystens in Barbados, where the coffins moved on their own, and they were big, heavy lead um, coffins. It's an amazing story. But we were down, I was down there with her uh, in this mysterious tomb where they had moved, and we were doing a BBC documentary about them. But I said we share things. Now, the trying to bring together, trying to reconcile um, my interest in the paranormal, I would say that if you and I were research chemists, that we would be very interested in what happened when certain chemical processes took place, especially if we're chemistry teachers, as to why certain chemicals react with one another in particular ways. And by studying them and setting up experiments, and observing the results of the experiments, uh, that we can learn far more about chemistry, that we can take our knowledge to a greater depth. And this is how I feel about the paranormal. I think, you see, that we are in an extremely mysterious and interesting universe. Whether we go down into the mystery of the microcosm and look at things like, you know, bisons and quarks, or if we go out into the furthest, reaches of the universe which is so immensely big that it might just as well be infinite and we look in both directions and then there's a third dimension which is what we might call the paranormal or the anomalous where things happen which seem to go against the normal laws of physics what we might call the natural laws and those are the things which interest us. Now, how do I reconcile this with a religious faith? I believe absolutely in the existence of a loving and all-powerful God at the back of the universe, a creator, a sustainer of the universe. And I think that one of the many gifts which he has in his grace and love bestowed on human beings is the gift of curiosity. He wants us, and this is why the universe is made in such a wonderful way, he wants us, his creation, his children, in the sublime sense, to learn. And he's given us this desire to find out why things work as they do. And so that's how I, I reconcile my research into the paranormal as being neither more nor less acceptable uh, within a religious faith uh, than the chemist or the physicist or the biologist who is researching in an area that covers the natural laws. I think that curiosity is a gift from God and he wants us to employ it. And that is how I can bring together my faith in God with my uh, absolute fascination with all the mysterious things in the universe that he's made for us. Okay. Now, I have to, I have to ask, because I, I have to quote Michael Palin on this, because I think I'm, I'm akin to him in terms of my own beliefs, and I'm, I'm, pre I'm premising a question by telling you this, that I, I would kind of class myself as somewhat of a, an agnostic with doubts. So, um, and it was that reason that I asked, I asked Daniel Brinkley some, a similar question. Uh, this is the man I, I mentioned to you who who yes, claims indeed. to have, have passed away for 28 minutes and, and, and kind of gone to the other side and has spent the rest of his life telling the world about it. And why why did it have to be a mystery? And why does a particular person have to, or, or, or uh, one person be allowed to see it and the rest of us not be allowed to see it? And wh where does it all come from? Who created it? 
I, I always see religion as a man-made phenomenon. I, I have a great difficulty in, uh, in, 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 in believing in this all-powerful being because I think it's something created out of the fear of death or something like that. Well, can I, can I begin by saying that I welcome a conversation with um, a, a thoughtful agnostic because uh, I was one myself for years and I, I think it is so important to be open and honest about what we think about the universe. It's to question things. One of the biggest problems comes under the heading of theodicy, which is the attempt to reconcile the ghastly suffering that so many people go through, uh, whether they're dying of incurable diseases or whether they're being starved or whether a tsunami has washed away everything they owned, including the leather loved ones. Uh, when we look at all the evil in the world, all the danger, um, then try to reconcile that with a loving and powerful God. And of course, it, it has plagued and puzzled men and women of faith for centuries. Now, there's a, a marvelous thinker from the First World War, Studdett Kennedy, who was known as Woodbine Willie because he would give uh, a woodbine and a cup of tea to the troops in the trenches, as well as being their padre. Marvellous bloke, and saw all the suffering in trench warfare in 1914-18. And in one of his many very worthwhile books, Studdett Kennedy said, you will still have doubts, but you'll be able to live with them. Now that is how I put together the, the problem of being a man of faith and being faced with all the difficulties that you, as a highly intelligent agnostic who is examining the world from your perspective, uh, this is how I try and put the thing together. I believe that the most, the, the most wonderful experience any of us can have is the experience of love. Love brings the greatest happiness and it cannot be bought, and it cannot be enforced. You cannot threaten someone to make them love you, and you cannot bribe them. It has to be spontaneous. It has to come from a totally free being. Now, unless God has given us freedom, unless we have genuine choice, then we are incapable of love. And the problem there is that so much evil comes from people who make wrong choices. Now, this is just one of the ways in which we can look into the problem that theodicy examines, that unless we are genuinely free beings, we cannot experience the greatest happiness there is. And the danger of free will is the most dangerous gift that uh, any creator could give to his creations is that some people will use it wrongly and you get the Hitlers, the Mussolinis, the Idi Amins, you get dictators and criminals and the list is endless and they cause so much of the misery and the sadness and the tragedy and the suffering in the world. And my second thought is that the, the universe is a, a logical and a consistent place. But when I was talking about chemicals in the laboratory, if we are not doing experiments with um, sulfur dioxide or if we're doing experience, uh, experiments with uh, uh, carbon compounds, the compound behaves and the elements behave in exactly the same way each time because if we don't have consistency we will never learn now those are very weak attempts to solve the problem of faith in a world full of suffering they only go a tiny part of the way but they do provide part of an answer or a portion of an answer so we could we could say as we think about them that when we're trying to find reason behind our faith, and I don't 
for myself want a faith which is totally irrational. I'm like you in your agnosticism. But unless I can find a reason for what I believe, I don't want to believe it. Thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, th that's how I put it together. I hope that's of some small help. Of course. But, uh, well, I want to kind of continue that for a moment on the similar thread. Because would I, am I right in saying, I may be oversimplifying things here, that if we knew for certain there was a heaven, if we knew for certain there was a God, and that by being good we would get to heaven and if we could see it and we knew it was there and it was it was indefatigable proof then the free will would be gone and therefore right. is that is that is that what, you, what you're coming at you are absolutely right okay if, if it was incontrovertibly true that if you behave yourself you'll go to heaven and have a wonderful eternal future uh, then we wouldn't have any burglars any criminals any murderers everybody would want to go there and so you've lost your free will Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm going to. I'm going to let that one. I'm going to mull that one over for a little while and then see where I end up. Um, okay. Let's go back to the to the uh, the paranormal thing. And and uh, is this is is your most recent book the world's most mysterious places, or is there uh, more uh, in 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 uh, that field? Uh, no. The the most recent the most recent of our books in that field is one called The Big Book of Mysteries, where it's uh, one of these what I call a coffee table book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. and the, and, yeah, it, it's one of the things that you tend to find on your coffee table and the, I only hope people read it as well as putting it on the coffee table but it's a big compendium of a lot of the mysteries which Patricia and I have investigated together over the last 50 years okay. and, and yeah, the reason yeah, I, I, wanted, I, I thought I was using that yeah. as a kind of a, as a, as a segue into the question of all the places that you have visited of all these mysterious places is there one that stands out that still kind of maybe wakes you up in a cold sweat in the middle of the night on occasion yeah you know, well, uh, the, the two things I think that interest me uh, very, very much are, uh, and they don't, you know, I, I'm always hesitant to say this, but um, these things don't frighten me. I'm just curious. <laughs> Maybe I'm too stupid to be frightened. <laughs> but, I think you're uh, suffering from I stupidity could, with all, in all sincerity, but sorry, go on. <laughs> if I could just tell you uh, my attitude to these things, uh, one quickie, I was in the catacombs of St. Calixtus just outside Rome, and we were um, working there. I was hanging back a little bit because I wanted to take some photographs, and they are technically forbidden, but our guide had very kindly said, um, I'm going to have a cigarette. I shan't notice if your camera flashes. I said, thank you very much. <laughs> and I was hanging back about 50 yards behind the main party. Patricia was on the next corner, because you know the way that these sort of reticulations in the catacombs, if you can see the next person, you know there's a right angle bend there. And she was watching the main party. I was hanging back so I could take some pictures. And suddenly, out of the darkness behind me, a hand comes down on my shoulder. And I wasn't frightened. I had three thoughts. If this is a bugger, I'll give him a run for his money. If it's a, a security man who's going to confiscate my camera, I will do my best to persuade him out of it. Or maybe it's something strange. This is, after all, the place of the dead. When I looked round, there was an apparition, a good seven feet high with a pointed black cap, like a witch's cap except that it was attached to his cape or cloak, which went all the way down to the floor. And I didn't sense any hostility in it. It was quite clearly a, an abnormal entity of some sort, a paranormal entity. I sensed curiosity. He wanted to know who and what I was. And then it just faded and went. Now, I'm just using that little story to, to show that even in very odd situations, um, I didn't feel fear. I was just curious about him, like he was curious about me. And of all the places where we've been, there are two that intrigue me enormously. One is the area of uh, the Christchurch tomb in St. Oystens in Barbados. It belonged to a family called the Chase Elliots. And in the early 19th century, Every time one of the Chase Elliots died and was interred in the family tomb, the other coffins, which were big, heavy, lead-lined coffins, had moved. 
They weighed about a ton each. It would have taken a dozen strong men, or eight at least, to move one. And the other place that's intrigued me, and still does, not that there's anything horrific there, or frightening at all, but it's the muddy pit on Oak Island in Nova Scotia. In Mahone Bay, Nova Scotia, there's over 300 islands. And way back in 1795, three teenage kids discovered the top of a shaft over 100 feet deep. And for 200 years, one expedition after another has endeavored to find the secret of Oak Island. And um, when you mentioned just now the world's most mysterious places, of those are two of them. St. Saint Austin's Saint in Barbados, where I did the BBC documentary, and uh, the Oak Island Money Pit in Nova Scotia. But nobody has been able to beat the flood water that fills the labyrinth under the island. Wow. Wow. Incredible. Okay. I'd like to move into the, uh, the last thing, thing I want to talk to you about, I would like to talk to you about, is... Um, a place in the southwest of France, which I know you're very, very familiar with, uh, called René de Chateau. Yeah. Um, can you, can you give, for the sake of our listeners, can you give a bit of the backstory and 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 explain what's going on there? Because there's a there's a documentary that uh, I, I've watched recently called The Bloodline, and it's quite a fascinating one. Whether I'm I'm, I'm still quite skeptical, of course. I think it's a healthy skepticism, but uh, it's definitely intriguing. Well, it's certainly a very mysterious place. In 1885, an almost penniless parish priest, Father Belanger Saunier, um, was given the living of Rennes-le-Chateau, not far from Carcassonne, in southwestern France. And within a very short time, from being impoverished, he had become one of the richest men in the southwest of France, and he was spending money as if there was no tomorrow. And he was giving lavish dinners um, to the parishioners who had been kind and generous to him. It was his way of repaying them. And he built all kinds of... Uh, he built uh, an orangery. He built himself a tower. He built himself a luxury villa. And uh, I can remember, Patricia and I have actually spent the night in that villa that he built. And... Uh, all kinds of, shall we say, ostentatious spending power, Belanger did it. He completely refurbished the church. He put up um, statues and paintings. He repaired all the windows which had had their glass missing. He um, did all kinds of work with statues there. And he made it luxurious. And, of course, the great question is, where did this impoverished parish priest suddenly get his money from? And the theories that have uh, been put forward in, the, in our book on Ren, <laughs> all the theories are there. And uh, the, the, the explanations range from uh, that he had discovered some Roman gold, because there was an old Roman gold mine not far there in the village, that he had found a way to locate that. Another theory was we actually spoke to the great-grandson of the man who had been Beranger Saunier's verger working with him in the church uh, way back in the 19th century. And this man told us how his great-grandfather, who had been Saunier's assistant in the church, had found, and we actually saw the secret panel in the old pulpit stand where the verger had found a small glass vial inside which was a piece of parchment. He took it to Saunier the priest, and Saunier dismissed him, said, oh, I expect it's just a holy relic of some sort. I'm sure you've got things to do. And having dismissed the verger, he obviously inspected that little parchment, and it was shortly after that that he became richest man in the southwest of France. And I wonder whether there were, because Rennes le chateau had been um, a Visigothic stronghold at one time, whether he had actually found a plan or chart that had led him to a number of Visigothic tombs. 
because it was their practice to bury their dead leaders with their jewels and their armor and their weapons. So, Right. Mainly, How does that link into the Knights Templar, though? Well, now, the Knights Templar were in the area, and they were um, in contact with the Cathars, who were also in the area, and who had a stronghold there, which had been overrun in 1244. And it looked as if they might have had some great treasure that the Templars would have known about, and that that treasure could have been concealed in one of the deep vaults, because the churches in Rennes-le-Chateau go back many centuries. They're very old indeed. And there's a possibility that some sort of Templar treasure was hidden there, something which they had learned about from the Cathars prior to the Cathar massacre. Now, the bloodline theory is that Berenger Sonnier had discovered some sort of proof that Jesus had been married to Mary Magdalene and that after the crucifixion, Mary Magdalene had come to Rennes-le-Chateau in the care of and under the protection of Joseph of Arimathea, whom some Bible historians would suggest was Jesus' uncle. And it was he who had given his tomb after the crucifixion for Christ's body. And the, uh, the theory in the bloodline was that Mary Magdalene had been buried somewhere near Rennes and that there was some proof that Sonia had got his money from blackmailing the Vatican by saying, I have proof that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene and that their children were absorbed into the early French royal family and that uh, some of them are you know remote descendants are still around today and there's an amazing secret society it is alleged called the priory of zion who know all these secrets and uh, so yes. that's how the story continues yeah how about this guy ben hammers well it's not his real name it's a it's a it's a anagram well, well, of the tomb man yes have yeah, you have it, you have you ever met him uh, yes, I have. Yes, he uh, he came over here when we were doing the documentary. I, you know, I made the documentary with them. Um, Patricia and I were interviewed as part of the documentary. <laughs> and, uh, and and what's your view? Well, I find it mysterious. I, I can tell you one strange thing that I have not only seen but handled the treasure that Ben said in the documentary. So I know that that is real. He brought with him, or he, he had, from the tomb, as he said in the documentary, some 30 or 40 uh, gold coins, which go back to um, Templar periods. And when we went over to America for the launch of the Bloodline film, uh, we was, he was supposed to have come over as well. Sadly, a member of his family was taken ill, and they sent the coins over to us to take to the states to display at the uh, the uh, you know the presentation the opening the premiere of the film uh -huh. uh, and we've we spread them all out on my desk and photographed them i've got individual pictures of every one of those ancient coins and then we took them to the states with us so that they could be demonstrated as that's what he said he had found in the tomb he found something in there because I said I've actually held them in my hand. So that much of his story is absolutely genuine. Now, in my days in the, uh, I used to do a lot of work with uh, Army Cadet Force Cadets, and I was the battalion rock climbing instructor. So I love rock climbing and potholing. And there was apparently, from the film and from what Ben said, there was some danger about getting into the tomb they managed to get a camera in but they thought there was a danger of rock slippage and and i have said over and over again to that team look you just take me over there man i'll go into the tomb i don't give a monkey i'll tackle <laughs> anything that's there but i'm waiting to have that i'm waiting to have that offer taken up because i'd love to go down there it's uh, it's strange that, that, that no excavation has taken place it's very strange, and I do just wonder 
whether it was as genuine as I greatly hoped it might have been. Um, there's something very strange in Rennes le Chateau. There is a mystery in Rennes le Chateau. There is, I suspect, access to a very considerable treasure, either historical or something um, that is worth an, um, an incalculable amount because of its, um, you know, the knowledge that it could reveal. And I'm intrigued by Rennes Le Chateau, and I would uh, love to take the thing further, and I'd very happily excavate the tomb if I could do so legally. <laughs> um. Another, moving slightly away from that, because I don't want to dwell on it too much, it's, it's a fascinating subject and it's, it's something I think we'll hear more about as time goes on. Have you ever been sucked into a theory or, or a story and found out ultimately that it was untrue or an elaborate scam? Oh, the, 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 the strangest one, and I, I think you'll enjoy this one. It, uh, it concerns uh, the vampire, so-called, of Croglin Grange. There was a guy called Augustus Hare who lived in the 19th century, and he wrote his, you can pick this up in your reference library, he wrote a, a very, very large autobiography called The Story of My Life. And at one period, a lady in the Hare family married a Captain Fisher from Croglin Grange up in northwest of England, uh, just north of the Lake District. And near Penrith, and the story, as Augustus Hare wrote it in his autobiography, was that the uh, Croglin Grange had once belonged to the Fishers. Business interests took them to London. They had leased the Grange on a seven-year lease to a family named Cranswell, consisting of Amelia and her two brothers. And Amelia and the Cranswell boys had only been in the place a matter of weeks before the uh, um, the mystery begins. Amelia was in a downstairs bedroom. The place was only a single story, according to the, the legend that Augustus Hare wrote it. It was only a single story building. Amelia was looking out of her bedroom window at ground floor, and she sees a thing coming towards her, and she describes it as a walking scarecrow with glowing red eyes. It starts to pick away at the lead lights on her window. A claw-like hand comes in, undoes the casement, and it climbs into the room. Amelia, by this time, screaming blue murder. Her brothers have difficulty breaking because her door was locked, and she's backing away from the thing. The boys are trying to smash the door to get in and rescue her, and the thing attacks her, bites her savagely on the face and throat. By the time the boys break the door open to rescue her, it leaps through the casement, races away. As soon as she's well enough, they take her to Switzerland to convalesce, and while they're there, and she is a, another Joan of Arc, she's a real heroine, this girl, I admire Amelia Cranswell, she says, we will have a plan. We're not going to waste that seven-year lease. We will go back to Croglin. I want you boys to take a gun each with you, and we will leave all the bedroom doors open. If I scream, I want one of you instantly to me, and the other outside the front door with a gun each. And lo and behold, they hadn't been back long, before Chummy comes over the lawn again. Amelia screams. Her plan worked brilliantly. Her bigger, stronger, elder brother is beside her in a matter of seconds with a gun in his hand, loaded and primed. The other brother's out the front door, and he actually sees the thing and fires a shot into its leg. It screams and runs to a nearby churchyard where it disappears into a tomb. Young Cranswell is not going in after it with an empty gun in view of what it did to his sister last time. He goes off to fetch help. 
the two clansmen boys, plus some of the local villages, the ostler and the blacksmith, looking a little bit like the crowd from a Hammer horror film when they approach Dracula's castle with torches and scythes and a big <laughs> hammer, you know, the usual, you know, rent a mob. And uh, they gather round the tomb. The Cranswell boys go in with one or two of their bravest friends, and there they find an old semi-mummified corpse on a dais in the middle with the coffin lid off and fresh red blood on the hands and the mouth. They immediately think, it's a vampire. So, using all the vampire folklore, they take it to the crossroads, a traditional place for getting rid of nasty things. They take the limbs off, they hammer a stake through it, they behead it, and they finally burn the bits. So that was pretty thorough. While they're doing this dismembering of the uh, semi-mummified corpse, they find a pistol ball in its leg, which matches the set which the boys had bought in Switzerland. It's a rather unusual greenish lead. And they're now absolutely convinced. Of that. And there are no further reports of attacks on either animals or people anywhere in the Kroglin area. So they're now totally convinced that they've found it and destroyed it. So, of course, as is our wont, Patricia and I went up to Kroglin to examine things. Well, the first thing we found was that Kroglin Grange is on two stories, not one, which makes it rather strange that the girl should have been sleeping on the ground floor. The next thing we discovered was that there was no church anywhere near it. The church was two miles away, and a limping vampire wouldn't have covered two miles with young Cranswell chasing him. <laughs> and the... The other factor, because Augustus Hare had written that this had all happened in about uh, 1880, 1890, when his uh, Hare relative married Captain Fisher, um, why on earth were the two boys using single-shot pistols when, if you or I had been hunting for something dangerous in the 19th century, we'd have had a very nice little... 45 6 chambered revolver of the kind that Wyatt Earp used. You know, the good old yeah, gold yeah. 45. I certainly wouldn't go there with a single shot pistol. Now, we then thought, well, the whole thing is absolute rubbish. Um, how strange, everything has fallen down. We made another visit and we called on the farmer, who was a wonderfully helpful lady, Mrs. Johnson. And she said, do come and have a look here. And within 50 yards of the house, she pointed to an area of her farm and said, I can't plough here. There was a church here once, and the foundations are still here. I just have to leave that fallow. Wow, oh, okay. Said, That's interesting, within 50 yards of the house. And now she said, come and have a look at the roof. And she showed us what an architect friend of hers had explained to her, that the upper story had been added. The original Grange was a single story. Right, we thought, that's the second problem solved. And then we did some other research and discovered that from various other investigators that what Augustus Hare should have written, and I rather suspect that he and Captain Fisher had had a little too much champagne when Augustus heard the story and wrote it down, because he thought Captain Fisher had told him something that had just happened in 1885 or thereabouts. The real fact was that the story had been told to him by his grandmother, who said, and it wasn't new, when I was a little girl. So we've now got to take it two centuries back, back to the past. Which explains the pistols. Yeah, that explains the pistols, explained, the roof was explained, and the church had been um, damaged by Oliver Cromwell's men at the time of the Civil War, 
and the villagers had come and taken away the stones. Hence the church that had been close to the grange was then a ruin, collapsed into the ground, sunk into the ground, and its vaults were all around it. So if we take the thing back to the 17th century, I was giving this as part of a lecture when a young doctor in the audience, when we were doing the questions afterwards, said, Lionel, I have an idea. Uh, he said, let's suppose that whatever it was that attacked Amelia was just someone who was mentally ill, a perfectly normal human being, but he had made his den in tomb near the church and that he went around attacking. There had been several other attacks, women, animals. He said, no, he comes across and on the second attack and is shot in the leg by young Cranswell. He limps back to his den and he thinks, they want a vampire. I'll give them a vampire. He manages to take the pistol ball out of the flesh wound in his leg. There's no shortage of fresh red blood to smear on the corpse. And he shoves the pistol ball into the semi-mummified leg of the long-dead corpse. And then, said my young doctor friend, he goes as far as he can, a couple of villages away from um, Croglin, and he dies of the infection that he has given himself from handling a corpse and handling an open flesh wound. He gives himself gangrene, and an unknown vagrant is found dead in a ditch six or seven miles away. In no way is he associated with Croglin. He's given a parish pauper's funeral, and the vampire of Croglin Grange is never seen again. <laughs> Very good. A good story. Well told. What is next for the Fanthorpe franchise? What is what, Any other big projects on the, on the horizon? Well, um, at, the, at the moment, we're going around collecting um, pictures and stories from haunted pubs. We hope that's going to be our next book. Excellent. And so we're, we're working on haunted inns and taverns. And we've got a marvellous one here in Wales called the Skirid, S-K-I-R-R-I-D, which is allegedly haunted because at one time it goes all the way back to the year 1190. My goodness. At one time in its history, it was a prison and a place of execution. And the uh, the thought is that some of those unfortunate people who were hanged there in what is now the inn are still hanging around, <laughs> if you forgive the pun. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, I would like to talk to you forever. I really would. We've gone well oh, over the hour, but it's been enjoyable. I really mean that. You're, you're a fantastic raconteur and, and very easy to listen to. I always ask one final question. Um, well, I say always. I've only done a few of these, but uh, I, I, it's, it's becoming a little bit of a tradition, a minor tradition. How would you like to be remembered? What a wonderful question. Let me just give that some thought. I think um, I'm going back to my motorcycling, and I'm uh, very honored to be the president of an outfit called Jumbo. Jumbo is a biker's charity, and we help children with special needs. We take the children, their parents, their carers, once a year on what's called the Jumbo Run, and we then help the parents and carers to look after these young people who have special needs. And we take them to somewhere like Toy Cross Zoo, or we take them to Longleat, where they can have a really wonderful time together with plenty of caring adults around them. And one of the things that they like to do, the Yardley Photographic Club, because we were set out from Birmingham, Yardley Photographic Club always come with us and take pictures of the children so that they can take them back to school or to show their families and uh, you know, to give them something different, give them a Cinderella day out. And they love to be uh, with parents, lifting them up, putting them on some of our big bikes. And so instead of being in a wheelchair, they can have their photos taken on uh, a big motorcycle. And the looks on their faces are unforgettable. And they can take those back to their schools, special schools, and say, I'm not in my wheelchair now, I'm on a big 1500 twin. 
And mm. I think I'd like to be remembered as one of the guys who made that possible and that uh, as president of the Jumbo Motorbike Charity to help youngsters with special needs. Um, I think if I was trying to get into heaven, I would show St. Peter one of the photos and say, I've done a lot of things wrong, but I've done this right. Reverend Robert Lionel Fanthorpe, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you very, very much. It's been a great pleasure for me as well, Shane. Thank you for having me on. Well, that was Lionel Fanthorpe, the very Reverend Robert Lionel Fanthorpe, I should say. If you've enjoyed that, I do recommend that you do, uh, that you direct yourself towards his uh, website, which is www.lionelstroke-fanthorpe.com. No, it's a hyphen. Yeah, Lionel hyphen fanthorpe.com you know the business um if you want to he- see and hear more and get involved with the irish side of the moon itself please take a look at our facebook page which is www.facebook.com forward slash irish side of the moon we've already got uh, 1023 people hanging on to us at the moment which is kind of nice and also if you wish you can download the archive of all our interviews from iTunes you can also check out uh, irishsideofthemoon.blogspot.com that's the whole shebang that's me for now the next time you'll hear my dulcetor tones and if you can stick it is with a lady called Betty Martini she's a she's a lady from uh, the southern states of america I'm going to take a stab here that it might be mississippi or down that direction, maybe South Carolina. I can't remember. I did speak to her. She's an interesting lady. Um, I'll be talking some more to her, and I'll make sure I get that right the next time. She is a major, major anti-aspartame working lady. Um, She's vehement about this, and she's done a lot of work on it. Um, It's an interesting subject, and it might be one to listen out for, because uh, there's a lot of people starting to pop up their antenna about this whole aspartame issue. It certainly is a bit murky, but um, it's hard to know who's telling the truth, but it's worth listening to her anyway. So I look forward to uh, talking to you again, and uh, I hope you enjoy the show. Take care. Bye-bye. We are Irish Side of the Moon. Freedom of information. Personal empowerment. The Irish Side of the Moon. I still have a dream. This is just a ride. ride. We can change it anytime we want. It's only a choice. No effort, no work, no job, no savings of money. A choice right now. Between fear and love. Love, 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 love. Freedom of information. Personal empowerment. The Irish side of the moon.